So, hello and welcome to our new webcast. This time today about the UNR 155, so the new regulation about cybersecurity and cybersecurity management systems. So the, the target today or the objective today is to give you a brief, brief introduction what is actually the UNR 155 about it and also touch how this impacts not only car manufacturers but also suppliers and the whole supply chain. My name is Manuel Sandler, so I'm partner here at Cyrus Consulting, started three years ago, coming from the functional safety area and yeah, now dealing in the area of cybersecurity since around a bit more than five years. If we look at the automotive industry today, so actually we are living in quite interesting times. On the one hand, we have a lot of new challenges, especially regarding cybersecurity. For many companies, it's still not clear how much money they need to invest, so their upcoming costs are not really transparent. There's a huge lack of knowledge and competence at the moment, not only in this area, but in particular in cybersecurity. Um, for many products, cybersecurity features is something new or it's not available in previous used versions, so the development needs to change, new aspects need to be considered, and some potential vectors are even so-called zero attack vectors, so there's no time to react. If something happens, we need incident response processes, where it's currently quite, um, quite overhead, so it's also unclear how much effort needs to be spent also across the whole supply chain. And also the new buzzword, the CSMS, the cybersecurity management, management system, there are also a lot of unclarity, actually, what is needed to reach a compliance there. On the other side, apart from these challenges, the pressure at the moment is also increasing and increasing. So there are increased uh, cybersecurity legislations there worldwide, as well as the public awareness. So something happening today, actually everybody knows it a few hours later due to social media. And also since a few years, we have a rising demand for data privacy if the GDPR published a few years ago. And in connection with that, also the expectations of the customer of the road use in the end is increasing due to cybersecurity or related to cybersecurity. So that our car is cybersecure in the end, not something people want to buy or to pay extra, it's just already expected. But if something happens, of course, that could this is the one of the worst um, impact on the brand reputation of a company. And if really something happens, it's still also not clear who is in the end really liable for that or how the risks are distributed between supplier and customer. So we have a lot of challenges and a lot of pressure and now we have even the new standards and regulations for cybersecurity. But before coming to that, let us spend one or two minutes shortly on these terms. So that actually, what is the difference between laws, regulations, and standards? So a law is a system or something, some set of rules made by the government of a country, of a state, or of a city. And everyone must follow them in the end to be legal. A regulation, on the other side, it's a more detailed instruction and the fruits of doing something correctly and usually only applicable to a dedicated area. And standards, like the ISO SAE 21434, it's some kind of a specification, a set of requirements for a product or a system or a service with a main target to ensure quality and efficiency and usually also as a reference document of what needs to be done. Important when having these three areas in mind is that the compliance to laws and regulations is mandatory. So everyone needs to follow that, otherwise there are dedicated consequences. But standards on the other side are not mandatory or their compliance is not mandatory. You should follow them, especially related to function safety or cyber security for product liability reasons, but by, by default compliance is not mandatory. When talking about standards and regulations in the context of automotive cybersecurity, we need to name, of course, the UNR 155, 
and the ISO SAE 21434. From regulation part, as said, made by the government, the UNR155 gives us a minimum set of requirements and the related type approval procedure to get mark access, market access. So actually it defines us the requirements for a cybersecurity management system. For the standards, we have, as I mentioned, the 21434, so the Road Vehicle Cybersecurity Engineering Standard, with requirements and recommendations in general to develop a cybersecurity product, and gives us also something like a baseline for the CSMS. And while missing compliance to the UNR155 results in an asset spam, we also come later to that, the ISO can help you to prepare for compliance and to serve justification in terms of evidences. So actually the 21434 goes more in detail than the UNR 155 and provides your dedicated baseline for that. And these both standards or these both documents are actually only the starting point. So in the context of cybersecurity, there are much more standards and regulations behind. We at least should be aware that they exist. So, for example, the ISO 27.1 for IT security, we have TSAX, especially in Germany. We have the IEC 62443 for industrial security, or the ISO PASS 5.112 for executing cybersecurity audits in the context of, cyber, of automotive. And many more, but today, as mentioned, we're only looking on the UNR 155 and partly on the 21434. So why actually do we need to follow? And why should there be, should those standards and regulations be followed? So first of all, actually we, we need them to release for our production, to start with our serial production. So the 21434 calls it, calls it cybersecurity case. So actually an evidence that everything has been done but a product can be produced and is cyber secure to start the production. Also, missing compliance and a lack of processes for cyber security might result in penalty fees or even fines from your customer or even from government side. I mentioned already at the beginning, in the EU, we have the product liability law. So if people get harmed, uh, the product liability law comes in place. So also here for liability reasons, standards, and here the 21434 should be followed. And not only for the product liability, also the UNR 155 was adapted by the EU law beginning of this year. And so also here we're not talking about a regulation or anymore in future, maybe also about a law for cybersecurity. And already mentioned, not following the, 21, uh, the, ISO, uh, the UNR 155 might resun, result in a state span. And I feel also a statement from the VDA, so the German Automotive Association, which stated, I think it was last year, that more companies will be willing to invest in cybersecurity, but only when relevant regulations and standards came in force. So actually, it's also one way to push companies to invest in secure products and also in protecting people on the street. Let's look a bit briefer now, a bit deeper now in the UNR155. And again, let's get one step back. So the UNR155 is developed by the UNECE. The UNECE are or is the United Nations Economy Commission for Europe. This UNECE has a working group by the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, that's the so-called WP29. And this WP29 has a working group, the GRVA, which is responsible for automated and autonomous and connected vehicles. And this working group created the UNR155 and the UNR156, which are respectively will be mandatory 
for all UNECP member states, which are around 64 countries. And as a short side note, um, this is a good possibility to check if your counterparts, if you're talking about cybersecurity and the UN regulation, really has experience and really knows what he's talking about. Many companies and many so-called experts are always talking about the W29 for cybersecurity management system, which is actually the whole world forum which creates hundreds of regulations. So really the cybersecurity regulation is a UNR155 and the W3P29 is only the forum who creates and organizes that. And as a side note, the UNR156 is for software update management systems, but that is not the topic today. So discussing, or shortly let's have a look on the scope of this document. So this regulation applies to vehicle categories of the category so-called M and N, as well as a category O with at least one electronic unit. That's, you can see on the left side, the requirement 1.1 and the 1.2. So it also applies for vehicle of the category L6 and L7, if they have automated driving functionalities from level three onwards. So what does it mean? We have level one, which are vehicles with at least four wheels and used for carrying of, passenger, of passengers, typical cars or buses or anything to um, carry passengers. Category N, that's power-driven vehicles with at least four wheels and used for the carriage of goods, pickup trucks, vans, commercial trucks, or as one of our customer requests, also trucks for collecting uh, the garbage on, our, on your streets. We have also the category O, so also trailers, if they include one ECU, are also in the scope of this document. And same L6 and L7, which are, let's call it light vehicles with up to 350, respectively, four kilogram. So all different kind of vehicles are in scope here. But, and that's also an interesting fact, motor bicycle, motorcycles or bicycles uh, with two wheels, motorbikes, are not in the scope of the UNR155. I already talked about the sales ban before. So the UN regulation was enforced in January last year and is mandatory for all new vehicle types from July this year and for all new vehicles from July 24. New vehicle types means with a new electric electronic architecture and new vehicles of course are all different kind of vehicles. As mentioned, affecting around 64 countries with yeah, more than 30 million cars, probably already around 40 million cars per year. And you see it's UN, our member countries are not only in the EU, it includes South Africa, um, Australia, and many more. New Zealand, for example. But what about the others? So also the others, as mentioned here, non-member states have similar principles. So in the US, we have the safe declaration, which is defined by local authorities. In China, we have similar requirements from the CCC, so the China Compulsory Certificate. And also other countries outside of the UNER scope uh, have the possibility to implement requirements through the so-called global technical regulations, the GDRs. And also side note from India, they also have their own approach, but it's actually um, yeah, strongly based on the UNR155. So even for the non-member countries, more or less similar activities are in place or are ongoing. Um, so also the same expectations are in these countries. So as a next step, Let's have a look into the details of, well, not in the details, but in the structure and in the content of this regulation. So actually, the UNR, especially from an engineer perspective, or really from the people who need to apply that and need to integrate it into the development, it has two major parts. 
One part defines the requirements for a cybersecurity management systems, system. So vehicle manufacturers require CSMS on organizational level, and one dedicated chapter describes which kind of requirements are needed here. And the second part is about the vehicle requirements, which actually more or less has to show or will show that the requirements from your processes, from your CSMS, all the things you defined are applied for the dedicated vehicle type, which is going to be approved, and that the activities are sufficient. The risks are identified, risks are mitigated, and the vehicle type is cyber secure. So, if the organization requirements for the CSMS and the requirements how to apply them to the different products, respectively the vehicles. Looking a bit closer to the CSMS requirements, first of all, we need to highlight, I need to highlight, they are not only for the development. So the CSMS, a cybersecurity management system, needs to apply to the whole product lifecycle, to the development, to the production, and the whole production phase until decommissioning or recycling. And some basic requirements are that your cybersecurity management system processes, first of all, must cover all phases of the life cycle, as mentioned. The CSMS processes shall ensure security, that security is adequately considered. So risks are identified. There are processes for testing your vehicles. Are your risks mitigated? Are the controls implemented? Cyber threats and vulnerabilities must be mitigated in a reasonable time frame. So also here you need to have the processes, the infrastructure for that. And that cybersecurity management processes are in place to monitor, to detect, and to respond to cyber attacks. So if something really happens, that your company is prepared. They know what to do, they know the different steps, they know how to analyze it and how to react and to make your vehicle or your product secure as fast as possible. On the other side, so this is just a snapshot. On the other side, we have the vehicle requirements. Again, for the whole product life cycle. And we need to show first that the supplier related risk for this dedicated vehicle type are identified and managed. That the risk assessment has been performed so that the technical risks of the product related to cybersecurity are identified, are managed, and mitigated. That sufficient testing has been done to ensure that these measures, which you identified in the step above, are really effective. So actually, are there these the right methods and do they fulfill their purpose? And that the measures which are implemented also able to detect and prevent further cyber attacks, not only to reduce the risk, also to being able to detect if something is happening. And based on that, we have different preconditions or can use different documents as preconditions for doing the so-called type approval, so getting approval for the vehicle type, which starts with a description of your system, like the item description, item definition as mentioned in the 21434. You need your certificate of compliance. We'll also touch that in a second. Your risk assessment, so the TARA has to be executed. You need a concept how to handle those risks. You need to verify that the risks are implemented correctly and validate that these measures are sufficient. And of course, the whole supply chain is taken into account. So let's have a short look again on the Certificate of Compliance, the type approval, and to bring those, these both terms in the correct context. So we have cybersecurity management system, the processes and all this stuff on organization level. On project level, so for the development of a vehicle type, of a vehicle, we also have some management processes and management activities, and we have our typical development lifecycle.
starting with a concept phase, having something like a V, of course, dedicated Vs for around three years, with our typical activities starting from specifying requirements on system level, on stakeholder level first, on domain level software hardware, implementing that, verifying and validating that, and then going to the production phase, the operation phase, and the decommissioning phase, so the whole post-development part. And for this whole life cycle, we have different suppliers. Now, we have for the dedicated start of production, which is here in the middle. And before coming to the start of production, and especially to bring the car on the street, we need a dedicated type approval. Type approval for the vehicle type at the end of the development. But to do that, and as a precondition, we need for the whole organization the certificate of compliance. The certificate of compliance which showcase or which defines or determines that your cybersecurity processes, that your cybersecurity management system is sufficient and according to the UNR 155. So a valid certificate of compliance, a COC, for your organizational cybersecurity management system is the prerequisite to do the type approval for new and new vehicle types. Which also means just concentrating that your product and your vehicle is secure without ignoring a cybersecurity management system, without ignoring processes, will not work anymore. So companies need to concentrate on bringing their processes, their CSMS in place to apply then for the type approval. And as a side note, the COC needs to be renewed each three years. So it's not a one-time action. It needs to be updated and to be re-evaluated on a regular basis. How to get the COC? There's a dedicated audit behind. So we have the UNR 155, our regulation. There's the audit. There is also an a questionnaire from the VDA shared, which can support the preparation. And there's then the auditor, so the technical service and approval authority who defines actually your, yeah, or who evaluates your cybersecurity management system and brings that in place. And as mentioned, that is needed to get the type approval of your vehicle. All right, let's have, as a next step, a closer look into the UNR regulation itself. And also let's talk shortly about what is the impact to the supplier. So in the automotive industry, we have a quiet long supply chain usually. We have the car manufacturers, the OEMs, who produce the car. We have different tier one supplier who provide different kind of sensors, actors, or ECUs but also having tier two supplier for dedicated electronic parts, for software, for example, and sometimes even tier three supplier behind. And from an UNR point of view, OEMs are the legal entities registering for the cybersecurity management system assessments, same for SUMS, and they are requesting the type approval. And therefore they are the responsible parties. So the OEMs are responsible. And they are also responsible for the homogeneity of their vehicles. Nevertheless, we have a dedicated requirement in the UNR, the requirement 732, which states that vehicle manufacturers shall identify and manage for the vehicle type being approved, supplier-related risks, meaning the OEM is responsible to identify and manage the risks of their suppliers. And what is the easiest way? The OEMs forward the requirements from the UNR to their supplier and expect or require request also, whenever possible, compliance to the UNR from their supplier. So also suppliers must provide evidence of adhering to the regulation 
in order to support the type approval process of the OEM. Of course, I mentioned at the beginning, the 21434 provides a sufficient basic for that. So following the 21434, more or less already gives you all preconditions for that. But nevertheless, there, come, there comes additional pressure due to the UNR. If you're not compliant to the 21434, it might be still possible to handle it. If compliance to UNR is missing, the OEM is not, allow, not able to sell his car in almost all big countries in the world. So let's have, therefore, let's have a look in the structure of the regulation to identify which are the requirements which are typically forwarded from the OEM to the supplier. So you can here see here the structure of the 10 chapters of UNR 155. We have something about the scope. I showed that at the beginning. We have some terms and definitions. We have the chapter application for type approval, which actually describes the needed documentation, the needed procedure for that. Uh, we have the chapter about marking. So how officially is approval, type approval marked in the vehicle? We have a requirement about the approval itself, so how to execute the approval process, about the certificate of compliance, so general information about the CUC. And then we have the chapter seven about specifications. That was also where I was touching before with, you remember that organization requirements for the CSMS, that's at chapter 7.2 and the vehicle requirements, that's at chapter 7.3. The part, chapter 8, 9, 10, are some general information. And here on the right side, you can see now who is affected by those requirements. So the definitions, of course, to all involved stakeholders, the application for the type approval, so the needed documents, it's relevant for the manufacturer, the marking even as, um, affects the technical service and the manufacturers, the approval procedure is only relevant for the approval authority and the technical service who are doing the audit and gives you the approval to sell the car. The requirements about the CUC, it's also more general stuff relevant for the technical service, for the manufacturers. And then we have the chapter seven. The chapter seven is only addressed to the car manufacturers. So each requirement is stating the manufa vehicle manufacturer shall do this and that. But actually these requirements Maybe expect from 731, which is about having a valid CUC to do the type approval, are the requirements which are typically forwarded to the suppliers. So if you're a supplier and your OEM is requesting compliance to the UNR 155, you do not need even start to read the whole document. You do also not need to be compliant to the whole document. It's actually two main chapters which you need to be you need to consider. So for seven taught through about the lifetime of the management system, the processes, how to mitigate with the need to response, continued activities, how to manage dependencies. And then for the vehicle type, you need to take control about your supplier. You need to identify risk. You need to mitigate risk. You need to uh, identify measures for the aftermarket. You need sufficient testing. You need to ensure that you're measures are implemented, and there are some general requirements about cryptographic modules. So it's not a rocket science, and it's also, as I said, not the whole document. And actually, how can these requirements look like? So I have two examples with me. So the example 7221, which states that a vehicle manufacturer shall demonstrate to an approval authority or technical service that the cybersecurity management system applies to the life cycle phase is development, post, uh, de to the development phase, the production phase and post-production phase, actually to the whole product life cycle. So what is relevant now for a supplier, their processes also need to consider the whole product life cycle. And this can be supported by production control plan, sources for cybersecurity information during lifetime, the item definition, of course, for the development phase and many more. Another example, that's a big more extensive one, is about the processes itself. So the manufacturers have demonstrated that processes used in the cybersecurity management system 
ensure security is adequately considered. And these must include an organization, processes about an organization to manage cybersecurity, process for identifying uh, cybersecurity related risks, processes for assessing, categorizing, and treating the risks, processes for verification of managing the risks, for testing, for keeping the risk assessment up to date, for handling cybersecurity attacks on the field, and for providing data for support and analysis. So actually, and again, if you know the 21434, all processes, which are also all topics, let me call it topics, which are also covered by the 21434 and where you need processes in place to be compliant to the respective standard. And if you need more information, if you want more information, actually what is behind all these points? How can I work on that? There is a document freely available, the so-called interpretation document of the UNR 155, you can just Google it, which gives you behind each of these points more information, help, advices, what needs to be done, and also a link to the 21434. But be aware it's to an old version of the 21434, so it's to the this version, and not the latest one. But nevertheless, it's a very helpful um, source for understanding and getting into the details. So what does it mean and where we are and what are our next steps? So there are two things I want to highlight. First, and that's for us very important due to also our customer set, we need to be aware there's a big difference between how it impacts big companies like Volkswagen, Toyota, BMW, and how it affects very small car manufacturers like Aston Martin, Garden Mary, um, all the new startups with vehicle cars. So for big companies, they have usually a lot of resources already allocated for that. They have reserved costs per car for that. And it's quite easy for them to set, or easier for them to set up an organization due to the resources and capacity. Whereas on this, for a small company, where actually maybe two or three persons are, overall are involved in cybersecurity and one of them now needs to define all of these processes, this is a huge challenge. So they have quite limited capacities and of course, usually some lacking in-house competence, just they are less, much less people. They are not 30,000, maybe they are 200. But of course, on the other side, to change a small company, it's much more easier than to change a big organization with locations worldwide and thousands of engineers. And it's also harder to control them. So I don't say that big companies have it, has, have it easier, but we need to be aware that the challenges are completely different. And of course, a big company can say, yeah, of course, we have our organization, we have our processes, we have our CSMS, where a small company just needs to see, okay, how do I find someone who is actually able to analyze my products? So always keeping that in mind. So, and also having the discussions here between the companies, that's just complete different preconditions, but the same requirements behind. And behind all of that, of course, the topic competence, training, um, and enabling people to do so. And for all who is working already with that, now independent if we're talking with an OEM or um, supplier, we should know one, one important step for everyone is to know, okay, where are you at the moment? So what's the current process of complying to you and R and maybe also to the 21434? And that's something quite straightforward, but that could be for everyone, for each company, a next step to define actually what is the scope, what is really impacting you, um, what would be an action plan, so what is, where are you with the processes, how much, how big are your gaps to the standards, and what could be actions to, yeah, to ensure compliance, to reach all the required aspects, to implement a dedicated framework, increase the awareness, I realize a continuous improvement, so you're applying things that are coming back to your process and then piloting it step by step, training the people, not just throwing something over the fence. And here we have our CSMS, so the people need to apply it. You have process users, you have process owners, and that only goes step by step. And once you come closer, 
to your audit behind. Also here, prepare for that, do internal audits, let the people know where they are, how to handle the situation, and yeah, actually how to prepare for a dedicated system behind. So that's it mainly from my side today. Just to remind you behind, so we are Cyrus Consulting, doing consulting in the area of cybersecurity, preparing for our authors and assessments, and having our academy behind. And before coming to a dedicated short Q&A session, which you can also enter just easily in Microsoft Teams, just to highlight again, if you need more information, we wrote a book one year ago, almost one year ago, about the ISO SAE 21434, so the world's first officially licensed book for cybersecurity, according to the 21434, which includes all requirements from the standard and also now quite new um, video courses to do our own on-demand training. And behind that also you're able to do with these trainings an official certification with TIFF Rheinland behind. So thanks for your attention. And as I said, we are happy to answer your questions so we can directly type it in the chat. And we can, yeah, and then we can just discuss them. So feel free to, um, yeah, just enter your thoughts, enter your questions, just type it in the chat. Um, so this presentation itself, so we will not share the slides, but the presentation itself is recorded and will be made available online on our YouTube channel. So they can, can be seen afterwards as well. And I said, please feel free to type any kind of questions and anything where you are more interested behind. So maybe in the meantime, until there's a first question, just a side note, um, I mentioned that the um, so it's quite not a fresh news, but maybe not known to everyone. Um, I mentioned the COC is uh, available or valid for three years. So you have three years to do the COC and then um, you need to renew it. So some approval organizations, at least uh, uh, the big R, so the German one, and I know it from the British one, they are now doing also one year COCs for the starting phase where more gaps are allowed and to re renew that after one year. So there's an intermediate step, at least from some countries, um, offered. All right, so I have first questions. Um, so I have one question and I can also publish them that everyone sees them, sees it. Uh, so is there compliance tests in the UNR VTA? So I think you mean the VDA, a possible penetration test. So actually you need to, what the ex, I'm hoping I'm getting the question correct. So what the UNR is requesting is that you're verifying, validating your uh, measures to mitigate risks and especially to validate, to ensure that the mitigations of the cybersecurity controls you selected are correct and sufficient and enough, the best possibility are penetration tests. And the 21.4.3.4 even recommends penetration tests to do. At the end of the development is a final validation. So they do not replace any activities and it's also not something you should start or you do penetration tests and then everything is fine. It's just seen as a final validation that you choose chosen the right measures and you have chosen or that your measures also are implemented in the sufficient way. So let me check, we have some other questions. Um, let us select this one. Um, what do you suggest to first implement the 21434 and then the UNR 155 as an OEM? 
Um, since 21434 is not mandatory, but it's better to speak the same language. Um, yeah, definitely it's important to speak the same language. Um, honestly, I would say it's a bit depending on your time frame. If you have for dedicated reason to bring your car in the street, let's say in one year or even less, and your development is already quite ahead or quite, quite long in progress, it, you could go with the strategy in concentrating in the UNR to get the type approval and to um, yeah, get your CUC and get the type approval. So that is a possible way if the more your highest goal is to get the car in the street. If your highest goal is to get a secure product and get an efficient framework and baseline where people work on and processes, then I would suggest starting with a 21434. Because if you're still working according, if you build your whole company, your processes, your landscape based on the 21434, um, and you're compliant to that and the, the projects are following that, then it's just some minor steps, some minor add-ons for the UNR155. So if you have time and if your goal is to get a stable and a efficient process landscape, efficient CSMS, then I would definitely start with the 21434 and having the UNR already in mind, so it can also be done in parallel. Um, but skipping the 21434, I would only do if you have day based on yeah, strategical arguments, commercial arguments, focusing to have the type approval in place as soon as possible. And then I would do it under otherwise afterwards anyway. So the UNR alone, um, can prepare you, but as you said also, or as you wrote, um, your tiers are following the 21 and 434 anyway. And you should also follow that based on product liability. So, then let me check the next one. So, what competence are required to address the CSMS in UNR 155? Um, I hope I get in the question correct. So, what competence are needed to implement and to build that setting? I, that's the way how I would interpret um, the question. Actually, it's three major aspects. You need some knowledge about cybersecurity, of course. I don't mean the deep technical knowledge. So, the people who are responsible for that actually do not really do not know how to hack and all the different controls, that's actually not required. But they need to have a basic understanding of the processes, of the different steps, um, of course, of the standard of the regulation itself. They should know what means a hack, what is an incident. But I would say a very good base knowledge, especially in terms of regarding cybersecurity processes, it's one precondition. The second precondition is you should have competence in developing processes. It sounds simple, but it's more than just creating a few boxes. So processes it's, processes are something which needs to be understood and applied from a whole company in an efficient and effective way. And there are some standards, there are some ways, some good practices how to do that, and their experience is, of course, quite important. To have not in the end a CSMS, which is according to the standard, but nobody can use it. And the third aspect, um, it's more cultural aspect, Cybersecurity is something new for most companies and it requires changes. But may, most people don't like changes. So you need a person who understands how the company where you're working or where you want to implement it, how, it, how the company works. And this is usually not what is written down in processes. It's more how the people behave, how they work to each other, which things have been done in the past, how to convince management to get the amount of money for that to get the right decision maker. So you need basic cybersecurity knowledge, you need knowledge about processes and about the com how about the company and how the company works. Then let me check if we have so we're running a bit out of time. Um, then another one we have here about the post-production phase. So 
Um, how long do you expect the post-production period to least? Uh, the regulation 155 states the phase ends when there are no longer any operation vehicle of a specific vehicle type, which could be infinite. That's true. Um, let me start with an example what is what some car manufacturers actually requesting from their suppliers. So a typical requirement from an OEM to a supplier is that they have to provide cybersecurity support 15 years after end of production. Um, I also read from a very, very big American or US car manufacturer a requirement where they expect 50 years cybersecurity support after end of production. Um, actually, this is the whole topic is something which I, from my experience, there's no common sense, no common understanding so far in the industry. First of all, it's important that we distinguish between the decommissioning phase and the end of support phase. So a car manufacturer or another supplier can say, we provide you support for your car, for your control unit, for the feature for 10 years. After that, you can use it on your own risk. So that's something which already happening. Um, it's the same with smartphones where the support ends after a while, you can still use it, but you have a security weakness. Um, if that is the case, still you might have dedicated cybersecurity requirements for your decommissioning phase. For example, making all private data un unreadable or unaccessible. Um, which is, of course, is a big challenge if between end of support and decommissioning if there are 10 years between that. Um, also here, let's say that's an open challenge, but at least from my experience, no common, um, no common solution on that. Um, of course, one, one, one aspect we need to take care of is also who the changed owner and how to get them access to the cars, how to inform the cars. So I'm not speaking about the next five years, but maybe in 20 years, maybe your car is sometime used somewhere in Africa or in East Europe or wherever. Um, so actually my assumptions, so my assumption is that it will be a time point in time where the manufacturers will just not provide any more support and the usage of the car is in known risk. But if that is from a legal point of view possible, um, and if that will work in reality, if then really open gates in the car and people other people on other road users can be harmed. I would say it's an open question at the moment. We have no common, um, no common outcome so far reached or no common target. And the reason is also quite simple why it's still open because all companies are challenged by the current regulation, by the current standard. They are challenged to bring cybersecurity into current development and they're just not focusing it at the moment. They are not finding, they have not the capacity and not the priority to find answers for these questions. And I assume that will come in the next one or two years when the first cars are on the street, then these questions will be answered or there will be common answered for answers find. But at the moment, it just seems not to be that relevant for the big most companies. All right, so we have a few more minutes left. Um, I have another one here about a Tara and UNR. Um, shall a supplier cover all ISO SAE 21434 and CIA RASIC, who is responsible for the Tara? A single Tara is required on each level, vehicle, item, ECU, OEM, and supplier. Um, let's say the ISO itself requires a Tara on item level, and the item, according to the ISO, is a system or a combination of system with functionality on vehicle level, which is a 90% the case of the OEM. Um, but in reality, and how it is lived in almost all our projects, a tariff will be done on dedicated levels. And usually one will be done by the car manufacturer and one by the supplier. Um, and also here, the reason is quite simple. On the one hand, supplier needs to do one and should do one because uh, the OEM is the one who can best evaluate the impact of any kind of hacks or compromises 
to the vehicle and to the vehicle behavior. On the other side, the supplier knows his product best and better to identify potential weaknesses and to identify the potential attack path. So, therefore, usually it's done in bo on both levels, sometimes also on three levels, and the, um, the results are combined or at least compared to be available, to be possible to, um, to ensure that there are no contradicting contradictions, that everything fits together. But due to this different level of detail and this different needed knowledge, I would also recommend it to do it on different levels and also for the supplier to do that on their own. Also to be aware of what are actually the technical risks of my product I'm producing. So, all right, some further questions. Um, so, what else? So, we have another one. Oh, we have several ones. Let me check one more. But I think it goes in a similar direction. Um, it's also about the Threat analysis and component ECU level, which is exhaustive. Yes, it's a lot of work, especially identifying the attack passes. Um, and on vehicle level, so on vehicle level, actually, yeah, it's usually done by an OEM. Um, but you can also predefine or you can uh, pre select or evaluate which are potential areas of the vehicle units which are in scope, which are out of scope. So you can also do some kind of prioritization. Um, and what would be the right artifact to consider as input for the threat analysis on vehicle level? Yeah, in the end, all uh, information you have. So you should have some kind of a preliminary architecture. You should have an understanding what is the communication within your vehicle, and what are the interfaces to the outside, and what is the main functionality. I think that is other minimal things you need to know to evaluate the impact and to see what could be potential entry points. Right, so we have time for one more question left. Um, so we have, I mentioned that shortly, we have the question about, oh, that gets quite short, about the equivalent of the UNR 155 on the North American market. So as mentioned, um, we have there the self-declaration. So it's not the way that an authority proves you, you have to declare on your own or you will declare that you are secure and why you are secure according to local state rules or local regulations. So that's not a North American regulation. They are up to the states and you will not be checked or not be audited. You need to make a statement that you are secure. So it's a bit of the other way around. And of course, if something happens, you make the statement um, and you get responsible or accountable. Um, and then the last question for today, so unfortunately we're not able to answer all of them. Um, how suppliers come into the picture since it's a system approval is component in the underscope. That is what I mentioned before. So the OEM is responsible to handle supplier related risks. And usually they are forwarding the requirements from the UNR to their supplier. So if I'm the, type, the person who makes the audit for the OEM or the type approval, and I asked the OEM, how did you ensure that supplier-related risks or your supplier uh, has no risk regarding cybersecurity? He would say to me, they needed to, to be compliant with the UNR. They fulfill all requirements. And we did an audit, we checked that. It's true, here's the audit report and here are the evidences. That would be for the OEM the simple way. So usually the way how suppliers are affected by that is just they getting the UNR requirements forwarded and the OEM expects them or requires them to be compliant to fulfill them so that they have less efforts and they can ensure the type approval. So suppliers are indirectly impacted here, not by the standard, but by the OEMs because they are responsible that the supplier related risks for cybersecurity are managed. All right, so then that's it for today. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for your question and hope to see you soon then in one of our next webcasts. Have a good day and goodbye.